Upon passage of the proposed rule, these facilities would have to apply for a license. Both are family residential facilities designed for the detention of adults with, of adults with children and both contract with ICE. If the two facilities were regulated by the Residential Child Care Licensing Division of DFPS, they would be required to meet minimum standards and any grand appearances for residential operations that are designed to ensure the safety and welfare of children. Upon successful completion of the initial application process, a residential care facility will receive an initial license which would, such, which would be subject to review in six months to determine whether it should be continued or modified. My staff will make periodic inspections of the facilities and they'll investigate any allegations of abuse and neglect and any other alleged violation of minimum standards or the other laws that DFPS is responsible for enforcing. If during the initial license period, the facilities demonstrate the ability to comply with minimum standards and otherwise meet licensure requirements, they will receive a renewal license. Trevor is now going to go over the uh, procedures for today's hearing. Thank you, Paul. The purpose of today's meeting is to obtain feedback from the public on the proposed rule. Agency leadership will be here to listen, but not respond to each of your comments. We have the court reporter here to transcribe the comments so they can be included as part of the public input that the agency has received. We are also recording the meeting. The recording will be placed on the website later. We have a signing sheet for general registration and a signing sheet for those who wish to give public testimony. The signing sheet is just outside the public hearing room on the side over here. I will call the names of individuals who have signed in and find comments in the order that they appear on my list. We will adhere to a strict three minute time limit per person to ensure that people have an opportunity to speak. There will be no amalgamation of time. <coughs> Timekeeper will keep us on schedule. He or she will be seated next to me. They will hold up a yellow card when the speaker has one minute left. They will ring the bell when time is expired. We have a Spanish translator available to see it. We will also have a three minute time limit. Our hearing concludes at 2 p.m. If your name is not called, we can just further down on the list. We will gladly take your written statement. Please provide any written statements by December 14th to Audrey Carmichael. Audrey's email address can be found on today's agenda. And I'll be starting with testimony. Jonathan Ryan. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Ryan. I'm an immigration attorney and the executive director of RAISIS. On November 18th, our client and her 11 year old daughter who were both detained at the Carnes Family Prison, refused to sign the paperwork to be deported back to El Salvador the country they fled to escape extreme violence. When the mother refused to sign her paperwork, the officials inside Carnes told her, we don't care about your lives. Haven't we given you food? Haven't we given you clothes? Later that night, other officials threatened to take away the mom's 11-year-old daughter. Does that sound like child care? Do those sound like officials who should be responsible for caring for children? RAESIS is part of the Kyra Pro Bono Project, a partnership of four organizations that provides pro bono legal services to mothers and children held at both the Dilly and Carnes family prisons, meaning that we are in these jails every day. The Kyra Pro Bono Project has provided legal services to thousands of families detained at Carnes and Dilly in the past year. Through that work, we have documented the myriad of ways that Dilly and Carnes are unfit for mothers and children. First, there is systemic failure to provide adequate medical care to children. Nearly all children in detention are sick. Children are routinely told to simply drink water to treat any illness or ailment regardless of severity. We have filed two formal complaints with the Department of Homeland Security about these atrocious con medical conditions and we have not seen any improvement. Two, children are routinely left in the care of guards, not certified child care practitioners. The proposed rule specifically allows for this, without any acknowledgement that prison guards are not appropriate caregivers for children or any limitations on the circumstances when and for how long children can be left alone with guards. Three, multiple families share living spaces, allowing for children to share bedrooms with adults to whom they are not related, and with non-related children of other opposite genders. There, are already, there have already been multiple reports of child sexual abuse. 
likely due to these concerning living arrangements. The proposed regulations, which have lowered existing standards to allow for this, will only provide institutional support for these precarious living circumstances, for the precarious living circumstances these families currently endure. There is so much more to say regarding the atrocious conditions inside, but I want to clarify that enabling DFPS to remedy these poor conditions is no reason to approve licensing. Yes, there needs to be oversight. Yes, there needs to be investigation, but licensing is not necessary to respond to the incidents of abuse and neglect. Your agency is obligated to investigate reports of abuse and neglect. A person by a person responsible for a child's care, custody, and welfare, including personnel or a volunteer at a public or private residential Thank you for institution. Time. Thank you very much. Elisa Stable. Good morning and thank you. My name is Alyssa Steglish. I'm also an immigration attorney and clinical professor at the University of Texas Immigration Clinic. With its family detention policies, the United States Department of Homeland Security now confines women and children and child survivors of domestic and other violence in jails. The two family detention centers being considered for licensing under proposed section 748.7 can hold approximately 3,500 women and children at any given time. Multiple families are placed in the same sleeping and living quarters together, while guards and fences keep the families confined. The median age of the children in these jails is six years old. The Department of Homeland Security is asking the FPS to support its decision to use jails instead of community support and shelters for trauma survivors. Child welfare experts should know better than to agree to such a proposition. Licensing the jails will not bring them into shelters. The federal litigation for Z. Johnson, on which the department relies in promulgating 748.7, does not require jails to be licensed. In fact, the litigation began in 1985 to prevent specifically children from being held in jail solely for immigration reasons. The Flores Court requires children to be housed in non-secure environments that would be appropriate for placement of our state's own wards. Florida requires that facilities be licensed because of child welfare assurances that the licensing and regulations provide. It is not just a box to check or a paper to have. Licensing the Carnes and Billy jails will not accomplish what Florida promises. It's tempting to think that child welfare agency oversight of these jails can help. This is misguided. Section 748.7 handicaps the agency where it is most needed. It permits the status quo to become the standard rather than holding the federal government and its private contractors accountable to minimum child welfare standards. A new licensing scheme for family jails would be a stark and unprecedented downward departure from the state's current standards. The state would be compromising the best interests of their children by allowing people who are untrained in child care to set rules for children, allowing adult strangers to sleep in the same enclosed room with young children, and allowing children to be warehoused in prison-like environments. The state would be violating its own values and minimum standards of child welfare if it enacted such a licensing scheme. The FPS can best safeguard the welfare of the children detained in alien cars by withdrawing Section 7. today. My name is Dr. Laurie Kleckefren. I'm a social worker and researcher. As someone who conducts empirical research and regularly reviews the evidence base, the existing social science literature, and as a social worker with experience working directly with Central American women and children and serving as a pro bono expert witness in immigration cases, uh, my role here today is to provide the context around the evidence base related to two main areas. First, the pre-migration violence and trauma that propel women and children to seek safety and protection in the U.S. And second, the psychosocial impact of detention and violence and trauma. The women and children detained at Crimes and Dilly are survivors of violence and trauma. They directly experience violence and have witnessed violence or were exposed to tremendous suffering and traumatic events prior to being detained in the U.S. Many explicitly fled severe domestic violence and sexual violence in Central America, 
leaving loved ones and social support networks behind in search of safety and protection for themselves and their children. These experiences are compounded by high rates of gang violence, human trafficking, and femicide, or the killing of women. Women and children carry these backgrounds of violence and trauma with them when, when they become detained. The conditions of detention then mirror or reflect women's experience with violence. That is, the strategies and tactics of control and abuse used by abusers and traffickers are often repeated through the conditions, the rules, and the protocols and the structures in recommended detention centers. The restrictive nature of detention facilities and the highly controlled movement and regimented schedules re-triggers negative mental health outcomes associated with past gender violence. The negative impact of detention is well documented in scientific literature. Detention leads to the deterioration of mental health and well-being, and may result in outcomes such as self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, depression, post-traumatic stress, and anxiety. Research on children in immigration detention centers shows that children may develop mental and physical health difficulties directly from the detention experience itself. Research also finds that children's developmental, nutritional, educational, and child protection needs are not adequately met in detention settings. Furthermore, research shows that family detention may disrupt the family unit and undermine attachment relationships. Research suggests that settings based on choice, empowerment, and community are necessary for recovery. Alternatively, settings based on control, coercion, and containment may traumatize or re-traumatize individuals and families who are already vulnerable. Furthermore, approaches and settings that make recovery possible require the elimination of practices that seclude, isolate, and restrict mothers and children's mobility and decision-making. Despite any attention to the basic needs of women and children in detention, and regardless of the number and quality of the amenities, the resources, the protocols put in place, the evidence is clear. Detained mothers and children, particularly those who experience trauma and violence, remains a harmful and highly problematic practice, and one that does not support what we know about mental health needs of trauma survivors and those who flee violence. Thank you. Great, Hinch. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Greg Hanch. I work as public policy director for the Texas affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, Texas. My testimony is, not, it is in opposition to the proposed rule. NAMI, Texas has nearly 2,000 members made up of individuals living with mental illness, family members, friends, and professionals. Our purpose is to help improve the lives of people affected by mental illness through education, support, and advocacy. We have grave concerns about the endorsement of potential and, and potential licensing of family Im immigration centers as child care facilities. The evidence is clear that these detention centers in no way fall in line with the defined requirements of a child care facility. On the contrary, the conditions that exist in the Carnes and Dilly detention centers uh, have shown serious negative impacts on the psychological health and mental well-being of the families being held there. Both mothers and children in these facilities commonly show symptoms of anxiety, depression, and feelings of despair. The anxiety of children is often related to being physically separated from their mothers in these centers. The effect that these conditions have on a child's development must also be considered. It is not childcare when children are not only being blocked from achieving normal milestones, but are also experiencing progression in their developmental pathway. Well known in the mental health community is the impact that trauma has on the incidence of mental illness. What is being observed in Carnes and Dilly exemplifies this preventable phenomenon. The traumas that families are experiencing under lockup have shown in some cases to cause major psychiatric disorders such as major depression and symptoms including suicidal ideation. The stress and hardship experienced uh, by these families in their home countries and on their journey to the U.S is compounded by the re reality of life in the detention centers. These are circumstances that will re require years of treatment and services to address. On top of this is the reality that medical care within these facilities often has long wait times, no specialized care, and improper treatment. At a time when Texas leadership is building capacity and infrastructure 
in the mental health system, yet the advances are still not keeping up with the increasing demand. It is especially counterproductive to be adding to the population of people needing services. Prevention and early intervention are critical to address head on. This is recognized by the creation of the new House Select Committee on Mental Health in, in the Texas legislature. State agencies are increasingly coordinating their efforts to address mental illness in our society. We cannot justify endorsing a structure that sets our families and our system back. The, the psychological distress, fear, nightmares, and developmental regression that characterize life in these facilities are direct contributors to serious mental illness in our society. Thank you. My name is Satsuki Ina. Over 70 years ago, I was incarcerated with my parents in a federal family detention facility in Crystal City, Texas. We had not committed a crime and our rights to the due process of law was exempted. And bypassed as hate and fear gripped the country in 1941. We were held for four years and three months for what was later determined the result of hysteria, racism, and the failure of political leadership. As a Japanese American and former victim of the trauma of unjust and indeterminate incarceration, I am appalled by the possibility that the state of Texas would consider exempting the two facilities that currently house thousands of children from basic regulations deemed essential for care and welfare services of children. Bending the rules to justify the incarceration of children in a prison-like environment is no less than putting lipstick on a pig. In April and in May this year, I visited children and their mothers in what is euphemistically called the South Texas Family Residential Center in Dilly, Texas. Not unlike the prisons where my family and hundreds of other Japanese American children were held, our prisons were named relocation centers and family camps in order to mask the truth of our circumstances. As a child therapist specializing in the treatment of trauma, I was deeply disturbed by what I witnessed and heard from the children and their mothers during my visit. Stern, unfriendly guards led me and my fellow visitors through locked doors to the visitation room after requiring us to leave all our belongings, including art supplies and writing materials, in lockers outside. During my visit, I met with six families who had been held for varying lengths of time. Aside from the intense anxiety, depressed mood, and grief expressed by the mothers, I noted significant signs of what I would consider captivity trauma of the children. Hypervigilant checking of the guards, fearful clinging to the mothers, sad and guarded demeanor signaled the child's consciousness of being under guard. No doubt these children had previously been traumatized in their home country and then during the uncertain journey to the U.S. border. And now their incarceration, living with strangers who arrive and depart with no regularity while under the constant watchful eye of prison guards. When visitation time was up, the children clearly ruled out and fearful would immediately stand and leave the room like little automatons. Confining innocent children and their parents in prison settings is cause for long-term consequences leading to mental health problems. The past 30 years, I have served as a therapist to Japanese Americans who were, like myself, children while incarcerated during World War II. Decades later, having lived in a state of long-term anxiety, separated from familiar surroundings, sharing intimate space with total strangers, being held in the arms of anxious mothers, not only set an emotional baseline of fear and mistrust, we know now from research in neuroscience that the constant release of stress hormones under such circumstances has a negative effect on the developing brain. Let us learn from our past. Do not waver in the face of current climate of fear that is gripping our country today. Thank you. Thank you. Christina Parker. Thank you so much for um, holding this public hearing today and allowing us to have a minute to speak to you about why we're against uh, proposed Rule 40. 
Grassroots Leadership is an Austin-based national organization that fights against the criminalization um, of immigrants. We are against the for-profit private industry, um, including immigrant detention centers and family detention, de detention centers like the ones we see in South Texas. I'll keep my comments really brief. Um, we would like you to not um, adopt proposed Rule 40 because family detention and detention of immigrants is abuse. It isn't child care. And the main thing I'd like to say is that although this room is full, I have a stack here of 800 um, petitions from people who uh, feel the same way. Um, and each of these pieces of paper represents someone who couldn't be here today, but who wants you to know that uh, that we shouldn't call family detention centers um, child care facilities. Thank you so much. Ms. Parker, Mary Overton, and today I'm testifying as a member of the First Unitarian Church of Austin and on behalf of the National Unitarian Universalist Association. We appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on the possibility of the state of Texas licensing immigrant family detention centers as child care facilities, and specifically opposed adopting Proposed Rule 40, Texas Administrative Code, Section 748.7. This year, the delegates of the Unitarian Universalist Association's Annual General Assembly passed an action of immediate witness calling to end immigrant, child, and family detention now. Based on this and the principles of Unitarian Universalism, the Unitarian Universalist Association cannot support the licensing of the immigrant family detention centers in Texas as child care facilities and calls for these detention centers to be shut down immediately. The first principle of our association affirms the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Children at the Carnes and Dilley Family Detention Centers have been exposed to conditions that child welfare experts have called inappropriate, neglectful, and abusive. Class action litigation and reports of multiple organizations have documented systemic violations of basic human rights and dignity in the detention centers. These violations have irreparably harmed the children held there. The second principle of our association affirms justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Licensing under reduced standards will not ensure child protection, but condone neglect and abuse. It is not possible for DFPS to regulate or license family immigration detention centers without skirting the rules it normally requires facilities to follow in order to keep these children and mothers healthy and safe. The detention centers are unlike any daycare foster home, domestic violence center, residential treatment center, or U.S. Office of Re Refugee Resettlement contracted shelter for unaccompanied minors, which is regulated by the DFPS as part of its mandate to ensure the welfare of children. Allowing exceptions by permitting children sharing a single room with an unrelated adult and with unrelated children of opposite genders is unacceptable. By lessening the standards already in place to protect children's safety and well-being, the DFPS would allow inequal treatment and care of these children who have already been traumatized by leaving their homes. If proposed rule 40 is adopted, immigrant children who have traveled without adult supervision will be treated better by the state of Texas than children whose mothers have made the journey with them. In 2013, the association passed a statement of conscience on immigration as a moral issue stating that moral immigration policy would provide alternatives to detention for those not considered a threat to society and human treatment for those being detained, referring especially to these families with children. In conclusion, the, universe, the Unitarian Universal Association strongly requests that DFPS reject proposed Rule 40. Thank you for your time today. Olivia Good morning. My name is Dr. Olivia Lopez. I'm a professor of excuse me, social work. And from October of 2014 to April of 2015, I was the lead licensed social worker at for GEO Group at Carn City Residential Center. 
I'm here today to share my experience and knowledge about family detention and highlight institutional practices and procedures with respect to mental health and medical care and practices that condone psychological abuse, coercive interrogation tactics, and the use of isolation and sensory deprivation against children and their mothers as punishment and behavior modifications. <clears throat> These practices also include mandates of perjury and withholding information from federal officials, omission of resident information on written documents, and the hiring of employees as social workers who do not have degrees in social work nor licensure to practice as such. <clears throat> These practices and procedures create a situation where families cannot feel safe, exacerbate levels of anxiety, and increase depression, can lead to suicidal ideation and gestures and attempts. The effects of family detention impact the development of children across the lifespan and impact the level of function within their families, in their communities, and society. In my position, I was tasked with psychosocial assessments, individual um, treatment, facilitating stress management groups and women's health education groups, as well as assisting with weekly mental health checks. Additionally, I attended weekly meetings with facility leadership and immigration officials and supervised two staff who were titled as social workers but who do not have a degree nor licensure to do so. Social work at Carn City meant something very different from the social work that I am trained and licensed to do. For example, during the weekly medical, uh, mental health checks, I recorded any issues raised by the women regarding medical or mental health concerns on the form. However, I was reprimanded by my immediate supervisor for doing so. He was very clear that Gio did not want a paper trail. He informed me that the only note taking regarding the resident's concern should be residents educated on the referral process. I was also reprimanded for informing residents of the grievance process at Gio and subsequently forbidden from providing any information about the grievance or assisting residents to complete the necessary forms to do so. And for also allowing residents to see a map of the United States to inform them where they were in Texas and <clears throat> in the proximity to their family in the United States. Finally, <clears throat> I was told not to inform residents that they had a right to request their medical and mental health records. Because as I recall, quote, the goal, their goal is to use these records to support their asylum claim. Well, the cars families reported to me that they were frequently turned away uh, when they presented with serious issues. So the most egregious examples include a toddler being taken four different times to medical with severe abdominal pain. This child was later sent to Children's Methodist Children's Hospital where he underwent emergency appendectomy. Another took her seven-week-old son to the medical department and had to convince nursing staff of his illness. He was later halo flighted. To Thank you for your time. time Thank you. Good morning, my name is Lana Baxter. Thank you for this opportunity. I have spent 40 years of my professional life as an advocate for children and families. Until my retirement in 2010, I was a licensed child care administrator and a licensed child placement administrator and served in administrative positions in at San Antonio Children's Shelter and as the chief executive officer of Boys and Homes for Children in San Antonio. I'm a strong advocate for the maintenance of standards in child care and felt, uh, as I feel that uh, this is essential to ensuring that children are protected. I encourage others in my field to pursue a national accreditation that exceeded the Texas minimum standards requiring residential child care facilities as a way to continue to provide the very best for Texas children. I am here today to voice my concern that the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services is considering issuing licenses that would certify the parents and dental detention facilities as residential child care centers. As a member of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition in San Antonio, I am knowledgeable about the conditions in these two facilities and know clearly that they are not healthy environments for children. Many children have become ill, lost weight, 
and experienced additional trauma during their time at the Bill F. Carnes and Bill detention, detention facilities. And I believe that this is a result of the environment on these children. I understand that the standards being addressed here today are TDFS minimum standards. And I stress the word minimum. I'm appalled that the state of Texas would consider reducing the minimum standards even more to allow a for-profit, publicly held corporation specializing in correction and detention to be licensed for the care of children. I know from experience the importance of advocating for and ensuring that licensing standards are maintained in facilities of public serving children. No amount of licensing can protect children from the harm that comes from being held in a detention center. And to consider your plan would not even require these centers to meet the minimum standards that are required in other Texas residential care centers is abhorrent and against everything that the licensing, licensing division of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services has embodied since the inception of standards in residential child care. I have worked my whole life to ensure that children have a safe, nurturing, and stimulating environment and families to love and protect them. I implore you to consider that the children who have been imprisoned by the car in cars or daily detention facilities are God's children, and we need to look at them with the same compassion and hope as we see in our own children. Thank you. Sister Susan Martin. Good day, I'm Sister Susan Mika, and I'm with the Benedictine Sisters. Uh, our monastery is in Bernie, and uh, I'm part also of the Interfaith uh, Welcome Coalition, and part of the Leadership uh, Conference of Women Religious. Our region is 12. And um, we've been very involved with the coalition there in San Antonio, and we are speaking today against this licensing, licensing um, these family detention facilities are jails, and we really feel that they're inhuman and immoral. They're restricting and punishing, really, the children and the families. And as you know, uh, so many of my colleagues have already testified uh, about you know, what they've uh, endured even to get here to our country, and then we're re-traumatizing them. And, um, we just feel like putting these vulnerable women and children in these facilities is not the answer. And we certainly don't feel that our Texas agencies should not be issuing a license permitting these facilities to operate as suitable places to house children. Um, our sisters, at one point, we had a child care center, and it would be nothing like these jails, you know, that we're talking about here. Uh, we just feel that um, these facilities do not comply with general child welfare principles. And we do hope that you will investigate these abuse claims in the facilities and work with law enforcement and social services to rectify those abuses. We really do not feel like the state of Texas should be enforcing our current administration's policy of family detention. And we feel that licensing these facilities is not the answer to this problem. And that children will not be served better by doing this. And I guess like just in closing, I would just like to challenge each one of you in the sense of like, you're the decision makers here. And listening to everything that we've already said and the people to come, you've got names, emails, phone numbers, there's so much wealth of knowledge about what is going on in these centers, in this room today. I hope that each of you will take advantage of that because people are speaking out of the, their gut. They're, it's very deeply ingrained, I think, in us that have been involved in these situations. And I really do hope that personally each of you will take what we're saying and if there's any questions that you have get a hold of people and hear more of what all of this is because there is so much going on underneath and just in in uh, 
conclusion, I just want to say again, these family detention centers are jails. We feel like they are inhuman and immoral. Thank you. Sister, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Reverend Kelly Allen. I'm the pastor of University Presbyterian Church in San Antonio, Texas, a part of the Presbyterian Church USA, which has spoken out very loudly on a national level and produced a documentary about uh, the harm of family detention, along with just about every major other religious community in this nation and uh, Christian denomination who have spoken at a national level about the harm of family detention. I also chair the Interfaith Welcome Coalition. You've heard a couple of folks refer to their membership in that organization. We came into existence in response to the Central American refugees coming across the border last year and have particularly focused on the mothers and children in detention through visitation, through advocacy support, through receiving women and children at the bus station and taking them to the airport and uh, beginning along with the Mennonite Church, a shelter program within San Antonio for these families, some of whom you will hear from later today. On my church grounds is a nationally accredited children's center that has a mission to support the well-being and education, spiritual and emotional care of children. That organization has a mission to care for children. The Dilly and Carnes detention facilities do not have a mission to care for children. They have a contract to lock up families. To legitimize this licensing, to give them a license that will legitimize the existence of these facilities, demeans and diminishes the value of every other kind of licensing that this entity does. We do not need family detention. Family detention centers have not always existed. They are a recent invention and a recent policy decision and they exist only in Texas and one place in Pennsylvania. It's an embarrassment to our state and it's an embarrassment to the religious community which has rally an enormous amount of support for these families that have come through San Antonio and now are elsewhere in the uh, nation with their families awaiting uh, their immigration cases to be heard in the community. The appropriate caregivers for these children are their mothers. And their mothers are able to care for them and it is determined whether they are abusive mothers or not and they, they bring their family, they can bring their families to elsewhere in the country and live with family members and integrate into the community while they are waiting for their immigration cases to be heard. They do not need other people to care for their children for them. They need to be in communities of support, including the religious communities, which will support them and help walk them through the legal process for their asylum cases to be heard. Thank you. Good morning. I am Sister Jean Thomas Squire, a daughter of charity, <clears throat> and living in San Antonio, an hour from Dilly, an hour and 15 minutes from Carnes. The Daughters of Charity have been ministering uh, continually in Texas since 1895 with a special concern for persons who are marginalized and vulnerable. In 1958 and 59, prior to my becoming a sister, I was a teacher in a residential child care center in Birmingham, Alabama. The center had about 70 children in care. The daughters administered and staffed such institutions and much larger ones in many states throughout our country at that time. However, as research progressed and professionals became aware that large residential facilities did not serve a child's best interest, even in an environment that was very loving and the staff was trained in child development. The daughters and others running such centers, and you all are very aware of this, 
began to promote foster care in small home-like settings in place of these institutional ones. I come today to register my opposition to the proposed licensing of the South Texas Residential uh, Center in Dilley and the Carnes County Residential Center as Texas Residential Child Care Facilities. The findings of those who do research related to child development indicate that with infants who live with their mothers in detention centers, there is often a disruption of their emotional attachment to their mothers. This affects the general growth and development of the brain as well as social functioning. Likewise, the research shows negative effects from detention with older children, particularly with their psychological health, resulting in de uh, depression, suicidal tendencies, and other negative behaviors. I am very familiar with the environment at Carnes and Dilly facilities. I live with three sisters who visit there and two who provide translation services for the women and their lawyers. Others like myself do the transportation that you've heard about from the hospitality house to the bus station or to the airport after the women and children are released from the centers. So my question to you is, what is the good you see that could come from licensing an inherently harmful environment which is staffed with workers, the majority of whom have no training or experience working with traumatized children and their moms? How is this consonant with the BFPS mission to promote the welfare of children? There is no amount of oversight that could change the detention centers into an environment that would promote the welfare of children being detained there. As the Catholic bishops have stated, it is inhumane to house young mothers and children in restrictive detention facilities. It is appalling to me that your licensing plan would exempt Carnes and Dilly from some of the minimum standards and particularly disturbing that you would permit teenage boys and teenage girls that are of different genders and unrelated to each other to serve the same bedroom facilities to be housed there. Please do not move forward with the adoption of proposed rules for you. Thank you. Sister Sharon Baldwin. Good morning, I'm Sister Sharon alton and after hearing what has been said by my other colleagues, I'd just like to say I'd like to associate my remarks with them. I'm uh, a presentation sister. Uh, we're involved all over the world, and our special care is for women and children. I associate myself also with detention is, is not child care. No, there are other ways of caring for children, and especially, I'd say, of housing them with their families that are here in the United States. Our Catholic bishops have written an, um, a letter and instruction called Unlocking Human Dignity, which speaks against this practice. It is immoral <coughs> excuse me, to incarcerate innocent people. And when we think of especially its children, this, this just cannot be accepted. I have been involved since the beginning of the Interfaith Welcome Coalition in visiting with mothers and their children in both Carnes and Dilly. In Carnes, I visited with two families who were there 11 months. Can you imagine what effect that has had on those children? In Dilly, two that were there for seven months. And I've also continued to um, be with people in the shelters in San Antonio. I'd like to say that when I visited in Carmel City, the military culture was very much in obvious, even by their titles and by how the children had to respond to them. The fact that they had to be taken out of their beds early in the morning for count, to be outside, think of this. The same workers who are taking care of these children 
were the ones who were in charge of the men's prison before. What do you expect? I'd like to tell you the story of one of the children, 11 months. Somebody asked me, what's wrong with that child? The head is so big. And I said, it's because he has not been eating. He is physically and emotionally and mentally scarred for the rest of his life. And I'd like to tell you about a child in Dillon who was hurt along the way. His leg was badly scraped. He received no attention in what they call the perera, the doghouse, or in the refrigeration place either. And he was not helped in Dillon by any medical facilities. Please use other methods for taking care of our children. They don't have to be citizens to have good attention. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Laura Guerra Carson with the Children's Defense Fund of Texas. For 40 years nationally and more than 15 years in Texas, CDF has worked to ensure that every child has a healthy start and a safe start in life. As advocates who have only children's best interest in mind, we are here to strongly oppose the licensing of the conversion detention centers as child care facilities and in fact are confused as to why DFPS would even consider licensing these centers. It has been well documented that institutionalized rearing as happens in these centers, uh, even for short periods of time, is terrible for children's health and well-being. Growing up in settings of ongoing stress interferes with children's normal development, causing deep psychological stress as well as intellectual and cognitive impairments. These impacts can have repercussions throughout a child's life. As you have heard, reports from Carnes and Dealey show that children are suffering. They're experiencing weight loss, hair loss, regression to infantile state behaviors, widespread anxiety, and suicidal ideation. DFPS's mission is to protect children from abuse, neglect, and exploitation and to ensure compliance with minimum standards of child care. And child care licensing exists for one reason only, to designate facilities as being safe for children. We do not see how it would be within the agency's scope, mission, or best interest to license these unsafe environments. Even with the reduction in minimum standards that this rule proposes, it will be impossible to address the basic developmental needs of children detained there. You cannot remove the elements of deprivation and threat which exist in these centers to provide, in, and these things are required to provide safe environments for children. Whether you study these centers now or in six months, how will causing deep and long-lasting psychological stress meet any minimum standards for child care. By making our state agency responsible for an impossible situation, we put ourselves at risk for legal recourse and accountability measures that, it would, that at the very least would strain EPS's limited resources. If DFPS wishes to get involved to help protect the well-being of detained children, it is clear under existing law that there is authorization to do that without the need for licensing. This includes implementing periodic investigations and the authority to investigate and address any allegations of abuse. Licensing these centers will only allow the circumventing of previous judicial authority which aim to prevent children from being held in unsafe environments. And we strongly urge EFPS to have no role in legitimizing these centers as appropriate for children. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Because we hug too long. 
and I've heard stories of guards threatening children that if they don't walk the line, they'll be taken from their parents. That's not child care. It's the kind of child abuse and exploitation I want the DFPS to investigate, not to decide to license. I've personally heard two young children share their memories of incarceration after being released. One said he had made a paper airplane because he wanted to fly people to freedom, and the guard yelled at him and wadded up his handmade toy. Does this sound like child care? Would that behavior cultivate a child's creativity? Would his mom's complaint get heard? It didn't. Another child told me he was glad to have been released from detention because now he's gone into U.S. homes where he's seen and treat dogs nicely, like children should be treated. These immigrant moms wanted simply to take their children to the home of the brave and the land of the free, not even realizing that most of the guns and violence in their homelands had been caused by the failed U.S. economic policies and militarization of their formerly fertile farmland. We're all part of an interdependent web of existence, and I expect more from my fellow Americans. Please don't license these prisons as state care centers. We've heard from Catholics, Presbyterians, Unitarians. We have a faith community who is ready to help. Thank you. Um, 
And I, I would also want to note that, that uh, well, I'll finish with this say that to license these facilities uh, would not increase the welfare of the children in the, in the facilities would continue to put the children at risk. It would also put Texas's stamp approval on that neglect and abuse. Thank you. Virginia Raymond. Six days a week, I walk into this facility, 
and I meet with over 150 mothers who are with them are their children who all are sick. They are crying, they have fevers, they are constipated, they are bloated, they have diarrhea. We have been seeing eye infection rampant on a weekly basis. And we see, most of all, with every single child, what we now refer to as the dilly cough. That's what's normal. That is what we see every single day. And it is a sign of both the inadequacy of the child care that is provided, and also the inhuman standards in which these children are put. The erroneous title of residential facility, but what is actually an uh, incarceration facility. And there's a cyclical nature to what happens to these children while they're within this facility, because this becomes a stress that affects the mothers. And that stress and that psychological damage and that re-traumatization of what they have already been experiencing, that which caused them to flee their home, inhibits their ability to provide the care that a mother would want to and should be able to give to their child, especially in what would be deemed a residential facility. This is why we call it a baby jail. And another aspect that highlights the inability of this facility to even conceive what would be proper child care on a recent tour that I was finally given after four months of employment in this, um, in this facility, the, the children's nursery, which in Spanish translates to guarderia, is called a vivero, which is a plant nursery. They can't even make the basic translation to know what is actually happening here. So when we see these children going through with fevers that come out being told that it's just a change of climate and they need to drink more water, that they need to bathe their children better and treat them with um, wet, cold towels. And they are so constipated, they are staying up all night crying and crying that CCA employees come and pull them from the rooms because they're bothering other people. Because they're disturbing the other people that they share the close quarters with. And so I challenge the idea that this is a child care facility or even has the basis to be able to provide child care because not only is the, child, the medical care inadequate, it is irresponsible. CCA employees are not child care professionals. They are trained in corrections. They come from facilities that have dealt with dangerous men, and they are held in inadequate conditions. And I implore you to not license child abuse and to not lower a standard to meet a level that has already failed. 